Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest Asian history news and independent research from around the world. If you saw my previous video regarding the dating of the Pyramid of Menkore, you may have been left with a few questions. I should have also been clearer in explaining surface luminescence dating and also explaining why I think the position where the sample was taken from on the pyramid was not the ideal location. So, how does it work? During the process of preparing a stone block for building, and moments before such a block is set onto another, the solar radiation bleaches the stored geological luminescence in a cut stone surface, basically setting the luminescence clock back to zero. When the block is set into a structure, the undersurface and contact points are shielded from solar radiation and the reaccumulation of archaeoluminescence is initiated. Basically, the clock starts again. The date when the clock restarts can be measured, and depending on the error margins, a somewhat accurate date can be calculated for when the stone block was set in place. As shown here, the sample from the Menkore Pyramid was taken from a contact between two blocks on the area of flattened casing stone on the eastern face of the pyramid. The reason I believe that this isn't the best place to take a sample from is because of the anomalous appearance of the stone. Some researchers believe that these stones could have once concealed a doorway, therefore the stone could have been removed and slotted back into place. If this happened at the time of Menkore's reign, this could have therefore reset the so-called luminescence clock to his reign, or even after, depending on when the doorway was sealed. This part also butts up against Menkore's mortuary temple, and therefore it may have linked the inside of the pyramid to the temple, and therefore the flattened area could have marked a possible entrance. If not, it is also possible that some of the stone blocks were removed when the casing stones were worked to achieve the flat finish, and then replaced into the eastern wall. We simply just don't know, but the anomalous nature of the stonework at this specific point means the history of this part of the pyramid is somewhat debatable. Some people may argue that the pyramid was also recased by Menkore in some kind of renovation work and therefore a stone contact from the core masonry would have certainly been a better location for the tests. Which brings me to the work that was carried out on the Valley Temple and the Sphinx Temple, both of which sit in front of the Great Sphinx. Egyptologist Mark Lehner has shown that the limestone that makes up the Sphinx Temple, and also the Valley Temple, I believe, came from the hollowing out of the Sphinx enclosure, and therefore the temples are very likely to be the same age as the Sphinx, when it was first carved from the bedrock. This is shown from matching up fossil assemblages, and is accepted by Egyptologists and alternative researchers alike. So dating the Sphinx and Valley Temples with surface luminescence is of course of great interest, especially as many believe that the Sphinx is far older than anything else on the Giza Plateau. So, let's get to the results. The first sample in the Sphinx Temple was taken from the bottom of a granite block that sits below one of the limestone columns of the Central Hall. This granite sits tightly against the bedrock, and due to it being under an old eroded limestone column, it is therefore taken as an ancient and original part of the temple. The sample returned the date of 2740 BC, plus or minus 640 years. Three more samples were taken, one from limestone and two more from granite, and the dates were 2220 BC, plus or minus 220 years, 3100 BC, plus or minus 540 years, and 1190 BC, plus or minus 340 years, respectively. This is showing that the Sphinx Temple was most likely built in dynastic history, and with the error margins taken into account, three of the four dates obtained do point to the Fourth Dynasty. The younger date could be later restoration work or reuse in the New Kingdom. The surface luminescence dating could point to an older age for the Sphinx Temple, but certainly not as old as what Robert Schock believes. Before we get to Schock and Graham Hancock's response, the dates from the two samples from the Valley Temple return dates of 3060 BC plus or minus 470 years, much like we see in the Sphinx Temple, and an anomalous younger date of 1050 BC plus or minus 540 years, which may indicate there was New Kingdom activity in this temple, maybe in the 19th dynasty. 
So the dates from the temples certainly point to Old Kingdom dynastic history, and Graham Hancock discussed these dates in his book, Magicians of the Gods. If surface luminescence dating is to get an accurate date for a structure, the sample used cannot have been exposed to even small amounts of sunlight since its construction, else the date obtained would simply be a renovation or excavation date, and not the original construction. Robert Schock believes that these two temples show evidence of Old Kingdom repair work, with the weathered core limestone masonry covered with granite shieldings. Therefore he believes the granite inside the temples is a later addition. Graham Hancock mentions in his book that the new study does not provide any evidence to confirm beyond doubt that the original limestone megalithic elements of the Sphinx and Valley temples were built by 4th Dynasty Pharaoh Khafre. He continues, on the contrary, the only thing the study seems to demonstrate for sure is that these temples were reworked during the New Kingdom. But the scientist who did the tests has answered Hancock and Shock, and said that the granite samples were not taken from restoration blocks that covered the weathered limestone. They were taken from whole blocks in contact with the bedrock on which the more megalithic limestone core masonry columns actually sit. The scientist is clear that there is no evidence that this granite is any kind of renovation, and regarding the Sphinx Temple specifically, all indications show that it was in fact one of the oldest parts of the structure. The scientist says quite profusely that no samples were taken from the granite shielding that covers the weathered limestone. So that leaves us with scientific evidence that the Sphinx and Valley Temples, temples that as well as granite, are made from limestone quarried from around the Sphinx, are most likely dynastic in origin, with the very earliest date being no more than 3640 BC, but this date is at the very end of the oldest error margin. Between the two temples, six samples were taken. Two of them indicate New Kingdom repairs, but the other four imply an Old Kingdom foundation. This of course leaves the hypothesis of an ancient pre-dynastic sphinx, thousands of years older than the conventional archaeological interpretation, with a huge problem. But I do agree with Hancock that more samples do need to be taken from the core limestone. The last part of this video is concerning an in-depth climate study of the Eastern Sahara by Rudolf Cooper and Stefan Kropelin, that was published in the journal Science in 2006. Using a large dataset to model the ancient changing climate, and using more than 500 archaeological dates that were taken from more than 150 sites, they discovered that from the last glacial maximum of 20,000 years ago until 8,500 BC, the Eastern Sahara, including Egypt, was bone dry. There was no heavy rain that has long been suspected. In 8500 BC, periodic monsoon rains did begin, turning the desert regions of the Eastern Sahara into a more habitable environment. Although Africa did start to dry out once again, this period of episodic monsoon rains didn't end until 1500 BC, at the beginning of the New Kingdom. The data and mapping of ancient sites of occupation show that people were living on the banks of the Nile pre-8500 BC, but only in the south. Post-8500 BC, they moved out to the west and northwest as conditions got wetter, but they began to migrate back towards the east as conditions got drier. The first signs of habitation in northern Egypt along the banks of the Nile is from 5300 BC to 3500 BC. Conventional Egyptologists, of course, explain the erosion on the Sphinx, its enclosure wall, on the Sphinx and Valley Temples, with the heavy and often prolonged monsoon rains of the dynastic period. Independent geologist Colin Reader believes that the Sphinx is older than Khafre's reign, but he still places it within early dynastic history. This interpretation also seems to marry up with the surface luminescence dating. But of course, as the data in the scientific study by Rudolf Cooper and Stefan Kropelin shows, there was occupation on the banks of the Nile in the south pre-8500 BC, so maybe there was also occupation in the north at Giza. Without evidence, it is an assumption, but maybe the reason there is no record of pre-8500 BC settlements at Giza is simply because of the huge amounts of human activity that has taken place ever since rubbing out any evidence of lost settlements, unless of course the Sphinx is a beacon of this forgotten time. This video is just me taking a look at the scientific tests and data that have been gathered in the past 10 to 15 years. 
data that we need to take seriously, explain, interpret and not just discard if we are to fully understand the Giza Plateau. Yes, I often take a shot at interpreting the Sphinx and the Pyramids, but with so much data and information to wade through, over the past few months I've really just been trying to gather information from historic sources like Giovanni Caviglia, Howard Weiss, Henry Salt and August Mariette, as well as archaeological sources and scientific data. Many of you will know the incredible work of Robert Schock, John Anthony West, Robert Beauval and Graham Hancock, the four men that got me interested in the subject more than 20 years ago, and so with the data mentioned in this video, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. Personally, right now I don't know what to think, but I'll keep researching and will keep bringing you the information on this channel. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.